Good morning. I appreciate you being here. Uh, Monday here before Thanksgiving, and uh, very cool. Hope you had a good weekend. Um, the most important thing I want to present to you is that this is the only thing we're going to do this week. There's no lab on Friday. There's no labs on Wednesday. If you're watching this from Section H1, there won't be other lectures and stuff. The Mount Hood campus for students is closed uh, Wednesday through Friday. Uh, you might have classes tomorrow if you have a class, but otherwise and stuff, Mount Hood is pretty well shut down. So this week, this is the only thing we'll do. Um, next week, Friday, class presentations will be happening. So if you have any time over Thanksgiving, you want to work on that, of course, that would be awesome. Your call, blah, blah, blah. But now we're going to do is start the first of the chapter six areas. And we're getting into the area where we're going to talk about how electrons are placed around atoms. And arguably, almost all of chemistry involves some kind of electron movement, all right? Not only from the redox reactions we saw, but also from electrons uh, in polyatomic ions going back and forth. And so understanding how they're arranged around atoms is really important. Important. So this is the area where we start talking about one of the most important of the scientists, Schrodinger. And Schrodinger is a real character. He's very interesting to read uh, outside of chemistry if you're at all interested. But Schrodinger was the one that kind of pulled a lot of pieces of work together to make something which we still use today. So a lot of the things around atoms actually came from this area. And Schrodinger developed uh, some equations which look something like this. These are called wave functions. And if you have taken here at Mount Hood uh, Math 254, you have all the skills to use the wave equation in this thing. This is the side, and you put it in. And if you put some kind of a mathematical operation on the wave function, you can get the energies out of the electrons and atoms, which is really, really cool stuff. That's way more than we will do in Chem 221. All right, calculus is not a prerequisite of this class. I mean, terrible, I know. But anyway, we will talk about, though, the results of this stuff uh, and how it applies to chemistry, which is really cool. But at the very last part, if you look in this picture behind, this is actually uh, a woman's stomach. And someone wrote <laughs> a whole bunch of wave equations on her stomach uh, for this interesting picture. And I put that up here because this stuff can get a little strange. And people interpret it in fascinating ways. And I want you to think about this in the back of your mind, like, why would this person do this? Well, I think you're going to see this stuff can get a little trippy. We're going to see things that on the atomic level don't make sense to us on our level of objects and macroscopic world. Uh, so just kind of think about that in the back of your mind as we go through this most interesting chapter. So, so without further ado, let's see where this stuff all started. And believe it or not, it actually started with the study of color. Now, in my world, I've always been fascinated by color. And I went into inorganic chemistry because the metals had really neat colors. You can put some of the metals and catch them on fire. The flames themselves actually have uh, an element designation usually. So, for example, yellow is usually the flame that happens from uh, sodium and stuff like that. Fireworks definitely take this to the nth degree. And we're going to see how uh, changes on the atomic level allow us to have different colors and associate what's going on, figure it out. Visible light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, which emanates from the source as waves. The waves are electric and magnetic fields oriented perpendicular to each other. Light has always fascinated scientists uh, because, of course, it makes you warm. You can see absence of light you can't see. Uh, Newton sent light through a prism, and the colors came out. And through studies since then, electromagnetic radiation is a type of phenomena that's around us all the time. And there's many different versions of it. Um, electromagnetic means that this kind of stuff has both an electric part and a magnetic part. And light is one form of electromagnetic radiation, all right? There's other forms of electromagnetic radiation. But believe it or not, light gives scientists a lot of detail into how atoms and molecules are put together, stuff like that. Now, 
Maxwell, this guy right here with the cool beard, was the first one to put a lot of the theories of electromagnetic radiation into practice. And he talked about particles, and he talked about waves and stuff like that. But uh, from Maxwell's equations, we started to get a better idea of what waves are. Electromagnetic radiation is essentially a series of waves. And so if we understand what a wave is, we can start understanding electromagnetic radiation so we can start getting into those wild electrons in Schrodinger's. So we're first going to talk about waves, all right? All waves have a type of a wavelength and a type of a frequency that's going to be really important to us. Now, waves will have nodes and amplitudes, and in physics, this can be something you'll go into a lot. But in terms of our class, I'm going to focus heavy on what a wavelength is and what a frequency is. Now, wavelength, a lot of times, it's a lambda. Kind of looks like an upside down Y. It's a Greek character. All right, so if you see that, that means wavelength. And frequency, a lot of times, gets the Greek symbol nu. It looks like a V that's been italicized. Frequency and wavelength uh, are things we're going to use a lot. What are frequency and wavelength? Well, I'm glad you asked. So here are two waves. The top one is representing a, a visible light wave, and the bottom one represents an ultraviolet wave. Now we're going to see that both of these are types of electromagnetic radiation. There's differences, but we'll see what it is. A wavelength is literally a distance from where the wave begins and the wave ends. So you can see in this visible light here, the wave starts here, goes through up and down, and it stops right there. So it would repeat afterwards, all right? But it starts and stop right there. So wavelength is literally a distance, all right? It's literally something that could be measured with meters and centimeters and nanometers and stuff like that. This wave down here has a wavelength as well, all right? But you can see it's a smaller distance, all right? Like if this is a good scale, then this is a longer wavelength and this is a shorter wavelength. Also look in this picture, the wavelength started here and it ended here. You can define a wavelength in lots of different ways. It can be in the crux right there or you can have it from the beginning, wherever you want, um, but it will still be a, a wavelength. Now, in this picture right here, we have one wave and like half of a wave. So the frequency is the number of waves that go by per unit time. So let's say that our T time right there is one second, all right? Then in this diagram, we have one and a half waves going by per second. That would be considered the frequency of this visible light wave. Now in this ultraviolet one, you can see it's different. We've got one wave, two waves, three waves going by, and if this is the same time t, that frequency would be three waves per second. So when it comes to frequency, you can think about it literally as the number of cycles of the wave, or I like to think about it as numbers of waves, but it's no big deal. But it's the number of waves or cycles per unit time, and it's usually second. So a lot of times the frequencies will have just one over seconds, or some kind of unit like that, one over time. Now, I also mentioned amplitude and node, and I want to talk about that real fast. Amplitude is the height, if you will, from the midpoint to the highest position on the wave. And in these kind of waves, it should be the same if you went down or up, either way. But amplitude is that. Um, we won't deal with amplitude too much in this class, but later on it can be helpful. But I do want to talk about real fast what a node is. A node is a place on a wave where there is no wave, <laughs> which seems a little weird, but your wave, if you will, is traveling, and it gets to right there, and it looks like the wave is gone. But then it appears again, it's gone, appears, gone, etc., etc. So nodes are a natural phenomena of wave behavior, all right? And we'll see that that has some really interesting kind of perspectives. Finally, what Maxwell was able to determine and discover is that here we have a longer wavelength and here we have a shorter wavelength. So as the wavelength goes up, as that distance from where the wave starts and stops gets bigger, 
then your frequency gets smaller. So this has a bigger wavelength and it has a smaller frequency. Like if this is the same unit, then it will only be 1.5 waves per unit time. On the other hand, as the wavelength gets smaller, like the wave gets kind of shrunk down, then you have a bigger frequency. So like here we have three waves per unit time. So this is kind of what wavelength and frequency is all about. Wavelength, literally a distance, centimeters, meters, kilometers, micrometers, whatever, angstroms. Uh, frequency is the number of waves that go by per unit time. It's usually per second, but it can be anything. Questions? Now, there are actually two types of waves, uh, at least, in the world. And when I think of waves, you know, I'm always like, oh, the ocean. But actually, those waves are like moving waves, all right? They move in, they go back. They move in, they go back. Very hypnotic and, and cool. The kind of waves we're going to be talking about here in chemistry are more like if Clifford and I had a rope and we decide to shake it a little bit. Yeah, right on. These are called standing waves because the wave never leaves the area between Clifford and me, all right? And we can go crazy, <laughs> or because I'm mellow this morning, we can go very gentle. <laughs> yeah, totally, that's exactly it, right? Those are the kind of waves that we have in atoms, all right? So we're gonna see those are all part of atoms. And atoms move, but the waves themselves stay in the atom. Atom. So standing waves are more common. Now, if Clifford and I are very gentle, we may not have any, uh, like we wouldn't have much of a node, but more often than not, we'll have one or more nodes because these things go vibrating back and forth all the time. So, cool. All right. So, <clears throat> The symbol for frequency, once again, is this V-looking thing, and you can just write it as V, that's fine. Technically, it's a Greek letter, it's a italicized V called nu, all right? And again, the units of frequency are usually cycles per second, waves per second, something like that. Now, one thing that's been discovered, which is really interesting, is that for all electromagnetic radiation, and there's quite a few of them, if you take the frequency and you multiply it by the wavelength with the right units, it's always equal to the velocity of light, the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Sadly, it's only in a vacuum, it's that there's some little comes, some side things, but all things considered, yeah, frequency times wavelength always equal to the speed of light. So what that means is if we have a big wavelength, we will have a small frequency because wavelength times frequency was always equal speed of light. So one goes up, the other one has to go down. Conversely, the other one goes up, then the first one has to go down. So one goes up, one goes down, always equal to the speed of light. So that's why longer wavelengths have smaller frequencies. That's why shorter wavelengths have higher frequencies. Because as one goes down, the other one goes up. If this was a regular class, I would absolutely say memorize the speed of light. Uh, for you in this class, I would absolutely put this on a page of notes to have with you during quizzes and exams, because it's a number we're going to use a lot. And you want the full four sig fig value. Don't use 3.00, it will get you in trouble. Any questions? Now, this is kind of a fun uh, little video right here. It shows the different colors of waves. It's starting off up here in the blue, and as you can see, it's slowly getting larger, and the blue is beginning to turn kind of green. And after a while, the green gets lighter and lighter until you start to get to yellow. And yellow then becomes a little bit more orange and then a little bit more red. And those, this little diagram shows the visible light spectrum and how you do, how you can see it. Now, there's an expression in, uh, when you're dealing with visible light, it's called Roy G. Biv. Uh, that's Roy is red, orange, yellow. 
green, and then blue, indigo, violet. And these seven colors are the main colors that are seen in visible light spectrum. But for us right now, it's so you can see uh, red, orange, yellow, etc., etc. But anyway, what is important though is that uh, these wavelengths uh, are associated with the colors. So red is generally about 700-ish nanometers and blue is generally 400-ish nanometers. And what that means then is that red is going to have a longer wavelength, all right? But then if it's longer wavelength, it will be shorter frequency. On the other hand, blues and purples and indigos, whatever up here, those are going to have smaller, shorter wavelengths, and that means they're going to have more waves per second than in their particular thing. And this is kind of cool. So when we look at well, like my remote control here, woohoo, blue, all right? Well, the blue has got uh, information up there, so that would be 400-ish uh, nanometers, all right? On the other hand, if there's something red, and I don't know, maybe John's pencil container <laughs> is the best I can do. Anyway, that would be the closest thing I can see in here to something red. That would be more like 700 nanometers or so, so, cool. All right, so here's an example of some of the things you can do. So let's say that John's pencil thing up there has a red light from it, and it's about 700 nanometers, all right? We can use this information to calculate the frequency of that red light. So in these kind of problems, a nanometer is one of the Greek prefixes, nano. And we talked about it back in chapter one, which I know seems a long time ago. But a nano is 10 to the minus nine. So in, these are gonna be lengths. So a nanometer would be 10 to the minus nine meters. And you almost have to do this right away. Just turn your nanometers into meters right away. So that would be 7.00 times 10 to the minus seven meters. And then to calculate the frequency, this is where we're gonna use the speed of light because the speed of light equals frequency times wavelength. This number right here is the wavelength, it's a distance. So speed of light divided by this is what's gonna give us our frequency. So frequency, speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, divided by the wavelength in meters. The meters cancel out, and you end up with one over seconds, all right? And second minus one is sometimes what you see. Sometimes you'll see one over S. Sometimes you'll see second minus one or second minus one. They're all the same thing. People don't usually talk about the waves or cycles, but they will talk about the unit of time. Now, Hertz was a person who did a lot of work into this originally, and so sometimes instead of using second minus one, one over second, they'll just put HZ, which is the symbol for Hertz, and a Hertz is an inverse second. So this is a joke you might see Calculating frequency, it's so easy, it hurts because it hurts is what's used for, all right. If you have a radio, uh, FM dials are usually megahertz, which would be 10 to the six hertz. And uh, AM frequencies are usually kilohertz, so that would be times 10 to the third hertz. All right. So uh, the electromagnetic radiation spectrum does incorporate visible light. So you and I are looking at each other through visible light. But there's a lot more to the EM spectrum than just visible light. Uh, some of these things we've heard about, some of them we haven't. So here's the radio waves I was babbling about earlier. Radio waves are also a type of EM spectrum. And what that means is that radio waves have a wavelength, they have a frequency, and wavelength times frequency equals the speed of light. But also microwaves, if you warmed up your food this morning, that was, you were using microwave EM. Infrared, so you place it on a hot burner or something like that, the heat comes through, that would be an example. Ultraviolet, mm, got yourself burned in the tanning machine, I don't know. Um, X-rays, if you've had a medical thing, and of course gamma rays are another one we've talked about. All of these are different types of electromagnetic spectrum. Now what's changing between a gamma ray and a radio wave 
is the wavelength, all right? So gamma rays that are super, super small, 10 to the minus 12 meters, all right? That's a really, really small one. On the other hand, radio waves can get up to a meter in length. That's what they call long radio waves and stuff. They get super, super long. So the visible spectrum, the parts that our eyes use, is a very small part of the whole EM spectrum right down here. Um, it would be awesome if we could see, if you could see, quote unquote, into the ultraviolet or the microwave region. And if you're a fan of the Predator movies, and you certainly don't have to like any of these things I babble about, but Predator's always choo, choo, choo. Yeah, yeah. sound effects not necessary, but the colors were changing. He was looking through different EM spectrum parts, I think, to see like footprints and anyway don't go run out and see that movie although I think the third one was the best one but anyway prophet question good all right um, there's a saying for the EM spectrum, rabbits mate in very unusual, expensive gardens. And this little ha uh, diagram here shows you that radio waves are down here and gamma is up here. And so remember, gamma is higher energy and then, ra oh, we'll talk about energy in a little bit. Sorry, I was babbling. Uh, rabbits have the biggest, ro radio has the biggest wavelength, gamma has the smallest wavelength. Gamma also then would have the biggest frequency and radio would have the smallest frequency. Now, I started babbling about energy there. That's my bad. We'll talk about it. There is more energy as you go to the right, and I'll talk about this here in a little bit. But if, you know, someone says, all right, I'm going to blast you with microwaves versus gamma rays, which one do you want? Uh, man, take the microwaves, all right? Microwaves may not be the best, but they're a lot better than gamma rays uh, can be. So here's the kind of question you might see, and it says which kind of, uh, which of the following produces radiation with the highest frequency? Now remember, all of these are electromagnetic radiation. It doesn't mean that they're like, you know, things going to go in a nuclear power plant or something like that. It's just the way of it, it radiates out the energy. So the highest frequency, all right, is this blue line right here. We want the one that's most to the right. Uh, microwave is right there. FM radio would be right here. Radar is actually an acronym. It stands for Radio Detection and Recognition. But radar is a radio wave, which I didn't realize until I taught this class. And cosmic rays are not on this list. Cosmic rays are actually things pushed out by the sun, and they're kind of high-powered particles, but they're not electromagnetic radiation. So the one that's most to the right right here is microwaves, all right? Um, these two are both radio, which is down here. This is not electromagnetic radiation. It's something else. I suppose you created the Fantastic Four. All right, let's keep my prop hat on. Questions? This leads us into something which I think is the most important part of Chem 221, and that uh, arrogance has uh, finds its way into many different fields, all right? And science is unfortunately not an exception to that. So in 1900, Lord Kelvin, now Kelvin is the Kelvin of the Kelvin temperature scale, all right? Zero Kelvin, all matter stops, powerhouse in science. But he gave a speech, <laughs> all right? And he basically claimed that, well, you know, I think we've basically got physics down, all right? He said, you know, thermodynamics, which is super powerful, all right, said that, you know, all energy phenomena are basically understood and stuff. We got, we got this, you know, there's no reason for future people to go into physics, all right? But there were these two clouds, he called them. And the clouds were areas that they had to do a little bit more work on, but they should have them wrapped up within, you know, five years or whatever he was battling about. Now, the first cloud was what they call the failure of the Michelson-Morley experiment. And I'm not going to talk about that right now, but that was really important in the development of modern physics. It led to Einstein's special relativity. So just realize that right away, Kelvin is bumbling up because this, is, this was a huge area that's super important, but that's more physics now definitely than what we're going to talk about. But his other cloud is one we will talk about, and it was the uh, failure to understand what he called black body radiation, all right? And black body radiation is something that was really helpful in this section we're talking about. 
So I put this up here because Lord Kelvin is one of the powerhouses, all right, of science, definitely. But he was a jackass here, <laughs> all right? He just assumed, because he was so arrogant, right, that, that these things would be wiped out. No reason for people to do the, you know, you might as well go pump gas or whatever. I don't know. But it was, it was, it was a dumb thing to say. Um, science should always be open to new ideas. And in this speech, he essentially tried to shut down, I think, a lot of potential for people. And, uh, so just realize that there's a lot of times more things just around the horizon. <laughs> you think you may know it all, but then tomorrow something else happens. Okay, I'm off my high horse. Now, black body radiation uh, was a type of phenomena that people saw. And scientists really didn't understand what was going on. They called it the ultraviolet catastrophe. All right. Um, if you've ever seen an object that's heated up, you'll see lots of different colors. Like sometimes it's red at first, and then it's blue, and then it finally goes white hot, all right? And the energy of the lights relative to the temperature, at the very high temperature, the intensity of light reaches the maximum in the ultraviolet, but then it goes off, all right? So this is a red, green, a blue curve, all right? And you can see this would be like more like the red area, the green, blue, and then finally you get to this area, you start to get really, really warm. And so they thought that as you just kept increasing the temperature, you would just have higher and higher kind of thing. But you never saw a maximum intensity intensity, all right? It wasn't following what they thought it should be. According to classic physics, it was breaking down. And so this was what they called the ultraviolet catastrophe, which was basically their model not giving the predicted behavior that was seen. A metal bar, like all objects at room temperature, emits infrared radiation. When heated to a relatively low temperature, however, the emitted radiation is in the red portion of the visible spectrum. As temperature increases, more light of shorter wavelengths is emitted until the bar glows white hot. In general, the hotter an object, the shorter the wavelength of light it emits. As the bar cools down, its glow returns to red. They thought that it would keep going past the ultraviolet, like you could get into higher and higher energies, and it just kind of stopped at the ultraviolet region. So that's why it's the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now, Along came Max Planck, who was a brand new scientist at the time, and he came up with the idea that, hmm, I bet that we can explain this phenomena if we introduce the idea of quanta, which are basically little tiny packets of energy being absorbed and released. So he proposed that these quanta could account for this ultraviolet catastrophe. And along the way, he came up with this equation, which is pretty important for what we're going to talk about, where the energy of the quanta depends on the frequency, which is the new part we saw earlier, times a constant. And now the constant is referred to as Planck's constant. 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So in this chapter, there are two really important constants, all right? Planck's constant and the speed of light. And you should know slash memorize slash put on your cheat sheet uh, both of those because they're going to be really important. Now, this diagram right here shows what was happening in the real world. Uh, the Raleigh gene theory was what they were trying to use with classical physics. And you can see it was just saying it would go up, 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 and it didn't do that. It reached a maximum and then went back down. So when Planck applied his theory, and there's a lot to this, more than we're going to go into, wow, it fit perfectly, all right? So Planck maybe didn't understand all the details, like why this was working, but it did match the data perfectly, and that's what scientists want to do. So what this came down to then is that Planck, kind of out of left field, came up with this theory, and no one really understood what was going on, but it was at least predicted, it followed the data perfectly. So there was something to Planck's constant we're going to see. All right. So <clears throat> E equals H nu is uh, the Planck equation, they sometimes call it. And remembering that frequency equals speed of light divided by wavelength, you a lot of times will see this as E equals HC over lambda. So Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. 
And again, what we're seeing here is that uh, frequency and wavelength are opposite sides, so one goes up, the other one goes down. But we can now extend this even further because you can see how frequency is proportional to energy. So earlier on, I almost started saying, oh, they're more dangerous on that side. Well, that's because as frequency goes up, your energy goes up, all right? You'll be absorbing more and more energy as you start changing the type of electromagnetic spectrum on you. So as wave frequency, excuse me, goes up, the energy goes up, and that tends to make it more dangerous, quote unquote. But that also means then that if frequency goes up, that wavelength goes down, all right? So frequency goes up, the energy goes up, and the wavelength goes down. It's in the bottom part. And conversely, if you have a smaller frequency, you'll have a smaller energy, but smaller frequency means larger wavelength. So understanding how this kind of relationship works can be really helpful to figuring out what's going on here. So radio waves have very big wavelengths, long wavelengths. They'll have short frequencies and relatively short energies. On the other hand, gamma rays have very high frequencies. They'll have really high energies, be careful around those, and then very, very small wavelengths. So, this question then says, which of the following wavelengths should have the, sum of the highest energy? Now again, wavelength is down in the bottom and energy is in the top. So as wavelength gets bigger, the energy gets smaller. On the other hand, as the wavelength is smaller, the energy gets bigger. So for this problem, you want a wavelength which is pretty small. Well, between meters and nanometers, which one of those would be the smaller wavelength? Yeah, yeah the nanometers, definitely, all right? So this one is smaller than this one. Meter is something you can measure. Nanometers are super, super small. Is Hertz a wavelength or a frequency? Good, yeah. It's not a wavelength. That's the unit of frequency, so that's not a wavelength at all. So it's not a wavelength. So the answer would be B. All right, you can convert this into a wavelength, C equals uh, wavelength times frequency, et cetera, et cetera. But this is not a wavelength. It, these are the only legitimate wavelengths in this list. Any questions? Cool. All right. <clears throat> Planck was one of the people told not to go into physics by Kelvin and his cronies. And he said that, uh, you know, everything is known, there's just these weird clouds. Well, thank you, Planck, for not listening to your superiors. Question authority. No, I'm just joking. Of course, I believe everything I say, of course. But anyway, yeah, so Planck was, that's why I wanted to say Planck was really instrumental. We use Planck's constant all the time in chemistry. So it's a good thing he wasn't listening to Jackass Kelvin, I mean, to Lord Kelvin. All right. Einstein came along and he actually had a part of his theory that uh, was really important. Now, believe it or not, Einstein only received one Nobel Prize and he's real famous for relativity. There's general and special relativity, which in physics and astronomy is so important. But we're not going to talk about relativity here. We're going to talk about his what's called photoelectric effect. And this was something he found that he's not as well known for, but it's super important. Um, in the photoelectric effect, light is shined onto a surface and light makes electrons flow. So this is like a type of a circuit and when the little gauge there pops up, uh, that means electrons are flowing. And we'll talk about when what yellow light shines on the metal surface, electrons are knocked out of the metal. As long as light of sufficient frequency shines on the metal, free electrons are produced and a current flows through the tube, as measured by an ammeter. The current stops flowing when the light is turned on. Now, if you think about this, light makes electrons flow. And if you think about electrons as particles, all right, like let's say that Clifford had a light uh, flashlight and he aimed it at me. All right, I would just sit here going, oh, that's nice. I appreciate the spotlight kind of thing. But I wouldn't worry about it like pushing me back, <laughs> all right? Like uh, if Clifford came up and like punched me, all right, this is terrible. Act. But anyway, then I would absolutely, because mass on mass makes mass move, all right? Light shouldn't make electrons move, <laughs> all right? Like light, if you beam it on someone, doesn't make them 
oh, you know, right? Like it would. So this was a wild thing. Like, why is the light making electrons move? All right. And that was something that fascinated people, including Einstein. So what the photoelectric effect shows is that how maybe light isn't just light. <laughs> I'm sure that sounds about as reasonable as anything. What Einstein proposed, maybe light has some particle behavior associated with it. Because if light was particles, then particles on particles, like be, like you know, little marbles hitting each other or something like that, or Clifford punching me. Sorry for the bad reference. Clifford, I don't think you'd ever do that. But anyway, that would maybe explain what's happening here. Now, no one had ever thought about this, all right? Like some people in classical physics said that, well, maybe the electrons would, uh, the amount of electrons would come out more as you had different types of light, but that wasn't seen. What we saw was that there was only electrons observed, no electrons were observed until there was a certain wavelength or frequency hit. So <clears throat> he came up with the idea of what's called the wave particle duality. And I want to talk about that if you're not familiar with that term. Most of the objects in our world are objects, all right? They're particles, all right? So like Claire's phone, my remote control, these are objects, all right? You can throw them, force equals mass times acceleration, blah, blah, blah. Waves would be things like from the light coming down. But certain things have both wave and particle behaviors associated with them. And light is the first one of these that we're looking at here. Now, most of the time, we're going to think about light, electromagnetic radiation, as a wave. But when it comes to the photoelectric effect, it's able to make those electrons kick out. So it's acting more like a particle. So this was an amazing thing, because no one thought that a wave, that light, could make something like this move. But it does make sense if you have like particles associated with it. This is, uh, they've done some really interesting things on this wave-particle duality. Uh, this is electrons they feel they captured and stuff acting. We're going to talk more about that here. I love this picture of Einstein with the guitar. All right. <clears throat> so what happened in the photoelectric effect is that they could understand light being emitted uh, from the metal if you think about light having little pieces associated with it. And pieces is too vague, so they called them photons. And so just like you can have the smallest piece of mass be, say, a proton or electron, something like that, you have these small pieces of light called photons. And each photon has only so much energy. You can calculate the amount of energy per photon. So let's say that we wanted to calculate how much energy one mole of photons with a red light wavelength of 700 nanometers have. Well, this is something we can actually do. So earlier we saw how the wavelength at 700 nanometers had a frequency of 4.28 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. We're going to take this number now and first calculate the energy per photon using Planck's constant. And then we're going to use Avogadro's number to figure out the energy per mole. So <clears throat> here's the wavelength. Here's the frequency we calculated earlier using speed of light divided by the wavelength in meters. By Planck's constant, E equals H nu. Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 minus 34, times the frequency, 4.28 times 10 to the 14th. And you get this amount of energy right here, 2.84 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. And this is considered the joules per photon. It's the smallest piece of light that can be broken up. Is this a big amount of energy or a small amount of energy? Small. small, big time. 10 to the minus 19th, you know, you can laugh at it and stuff like that. You know, me waving my finger has more energy used up than this amount of energy represents. So this amount of energy is not super impressive, but we're not done yet. Just like the real world where we have atoms and we think about moles most of the time, it's more helpful to think about light per mole as well, photons per mole. Now this, or joules per, or in this case, joules per mole. <clears throat> now in this case, we have this many joules per photon. And a photon is like the smallest piece of light. Well, you can turn joules per photon into joules per mole using Avogadro's. 
So we've used Avogadro's to go atoms to moles, we molecules to moles. Now we're going photons to moles of photons, same thing. Multiply it by Avogadro's number, you get a pretty large number. Let's turn it into kilojoules, 171 kilojoules per mole. Now, this number may not seem that cool to you, but to me that's awesome because in our, in our enthalpy chapter, a lot of the energies we calculated had this kind of value. They were in roughly the hundreds of kilojoules per mole. This is the amount of energy that you can use to break bonds. And this was an example I showed at the end of chapter five, where we figured out that delta H products minus delta H reactants for calcium carbonate breaking down, it took about 177 kilojoules. Well, red light, if you have a mole of red light, has 171 kilojoules per mole. So you can start making chemical change through electromagnetic radiation. You just literally light a light on it, go away for the weekend, <laughs> come back on Monday, woohoo! You've got a chemical reaction done. Photochemistry is a real cool part of science. And it's clean, you don't usually don't have a lot of nasty side products you have to clean up or anything. You do have to calibrate your energy with the energy of the light you're using. But wow, is this an awesome way to kind of do it, so. Questions? Next big player, and we're going to talk a lot about Mr. Bohr, <clears throat> was Niels Bohr, all right? Now, in science, at the time, they they used what were called sharp line spectra. And sharp line spectra of excited atoms were something that also wasn't very well understood. And Bohr came along. Not only did he figure out how to define what sharp line spectra were mathematically, but he had a model for how atoms are put together. So to understand Bohr, by the way, one of the elements is named after Bohr, so he's a big player. Anyway, to understand Bohr's work, we're gonna first talk about what the heck a sharp line spectra is, and it's a lot more fun than you might think, by the way. And then we're gonna figure out there, see what he did for a model, and then see how it applies to the atom. Bohr is pretty cool, in my opinion. <clears throat> Now, earlier I said how Newton sent a prism up to light and he saw different colors come out. And that's exactly what happens. Light, the white light that people usually see, is a combination of many different colors. And a prism is a good way to separate that out. So for example, normal white light from the sun has red light, blue light. Blue has shorter wavelengths, as we saw. Red would be longer wavelengths, higher frequency, shorter frequency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the light refracts, which means it bends a little bit as it goes through a medium, all right? Uh, no big deal. So people were fascinated by the lights that came out of white light and they started studying it. But first, which of these following light forms will refract the least, all right? So <clears throat> the ones that have the shortest wavelengths will bend the most and the longest ones will not. So of these kinds then we want, uh, we want the least, we want the longest wavelengths, and that's the red one, if you remember. If you don't, it's okay. Black light, if you've ever seen one of those in kind of a groovy 70s store, I just turned the eye clicker on, my apologies, I was babbling. Anyway, black light is actually a kind of an ultraviolet experience, it's not one of these. Okay. Now, I said that these are more exciting than I, than I said, and I really want to point that out here. If we pour methanol onto sodium chloride and ignite it, the flame produced is yellow in color. If instead of using sodium chloride, we use boric acid, a compound made of boron, hydrogen, and oxygen, the flame produced is green in color. Each salt imparts a characteristic color. The emission of light by heated or burning objects provide important clues to our understanding of atoms. You can get different colored flames depending on the source of your flame. Now, most of the time, excuse me, 
the flames we're used to are kind of a yellow color. Sodium is all around us all the time. And most of the campfires and stuff like that are basically a sodium flame, so it looks kind of yellow. But you can have many different colors. This is a boron flame, it's kind of green. Uh, lithium and strontium are more red, stuff like that. Uh, what they usually do is they have some kind of, say, a lithium salt, and they'll put methanol or something like that that burns pretty easy, and that's why you can see it. So excited structure, excited atoms will create light colors. And depending on which one you've got, it's kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> if you have any kind of uh, electrical things at home, you flip them on, a lot of times they will have a certain color. And often uh, the color comes from different gases that are inside there that are excited. Now they also use different materials sometimes to coat them to make their have specific hues. But uh, this is a pretty cool kind of area. These excited uh, electrons can make a lot of different colors pop out, which which is kind of fun. If a high voltage is applied to an element in the gas phase, the element emits light. Using a prism, we can split the light into its component colors. Every element emits a distinct set of colors unique to that element. Once scientists got over the ooh, ah kind of thing of light being split to prisms, which I still think is pretty cool, by the way, then they started to measure what different uh, things would do. And they found that different elements, when they put their flames through, they had certain, what I'm gonna call, start calling fingerprints associated with them. So this little picture right here is from taking a hydrogen source and it creates kind of a blue purple thing. We're gonna see this in lab later on, by the way. But anyway, when you take the hydrogen and and you put it through a prism, you see what are called little lines, and they're very, very sharp, which means they can be measured quite accurately. These are the wavelengths associated with them. So the sharp line spectrum that Bohr figured out are the result of taking some element, you light up the element, and you put it through the prism, and you literally see kind of like a fingerprint for the different elements. Hydrogen has one, two, three, four, Main lines. This one's kind of hard to see, all right, so don't worry too much about that one. But these four lines right here, we're going to do a lot with in the last lab of Chem 221. You're actually going to see these four lines in lab, which is kind of cool. This is on the edge of the ultraviolet. Sometimes people can see it, sometimes they can't. It's not a big deal. But with these four lines, it's cool. So Bohr was looking at these, trying to figure out where the heck these lines were coming from. So this is a little bit better picture. <clears throat> so again, this isn't just a regular light bulb. It's a fancy light bulb with hydrogen. And they apply some energy and it creates kind of a blue purple, you'll see. And they send that through a couple of slits so they get just a line of light. And then they put it through a prism. And lo and behold, you get these four sharp line images, all right? So these four images, these four colors, make up the color you see from the bulb. And I think it's just fascinating that they were able to set figure this out. They put it through a prism, they can measure it, get wavelengths and stuff like that. Really cool. Um, here are the different lines of hydrogen. Again, this one on the far left is kind of hard to see, but these are nanometers, all right? These are the four lines of hydrogen. And you're gonna see this is kind of like a fingerprint when it comes to these elements. Now, just like before, wavelength is getting longer this way. So longer wavelength means smaller frequency, shorter wavelength, higher frequency. But frequency is proportional to energy. So the higher energy would be over here, the longer energy would be over here. Now, the 410 through 656, these four lines, those are called the Balmer series because Balmer was the first one to figure out uh, that they were there and he measured them and stuff like that. Here are some representative fingerprints from other elements. So here's hydrogen. This is the fingerprint from mercury. And this is neon. And you can see they have like different colors in different places. So that's why I called them a fingerprint, literally. You can literally see that some of these were. Helium was first discovered in the sun before it was found on Earth. They used a spectrograph to see these lines on there. They're like, hey, this doesn't look like any element. Sure enough, it was helium. And then they found it on the Earth later, which was kind of cool. 
Now astronomers use this big time. If you're looking at Alpha Centauri, 4.4 light years away, we can't just travel over there and see, you know, oh, there's hydrogen, all right? So what they do is they get very elaborate spectrographs and they start figuring out, oh yeah, that one's from hydrogen and that one's from helium. They have to account for what's called the Doppler effect. In physics, this is movement that affects waves and stuff. We won't talk about Doppler effect too much here. But uh, wow, my hat's off to astronomy and stuff because they can figure it out. But I want to leave with this slide, the electric pickle. This is a voltmeter. It just is adding voltage across this thing. And there's a pickle in the middle. You can actually get your pickles to glow. This is called the electric pickle experiment. This is probably more fun than astronomy, let's be honest. But anyway, the sodium ions inside are being excited. And they have kind of the yellow color comes out. I had a student once soak a pickle in potassium chloride. And this uh, created kind of a purple effect and stuff. So if you hear about the electric pickle effect now, you know. All right, this is a good place to stop. Thank you. Uh, have a great Thanksgiving. Nothing else is happening this week. I will see you a week from today at 9 o'clock.